Hi there! So in the last video we expressed the sine and cosine of an angle as series of powers of x. The goal is to find the ratio between the two and write it in a special form that makes its irrationality apparent. The method for that is called Euclid's algorithm and we first see how it works in the simpler case of integer numbers. Imagine you have two planks of wood with lengths 434 cm and 560 cm and you wish to cut them down to a bunch of evenly long pieces. Mathematically, this amounts to finding the greatest common divisor of both numbers. We lay both planks together and cut off the overhanging part, which is 126 cm long. Then we see how many times we can fit that smaller length into 434. It fits three times, with 56 cm left over. Next, we fit 56 into 126 and see that we have 14 cm left over. And lastly, we will fit 14 into 56 and see that it divides perfectly into four pieces, with nothing left over. This is the length we were looking for. By construction, all previous lengths are multiples of 14. We have just applied Euclid's algorithm, and the result is that 14 is the greatest common divisor of 560 and 434. There is another geometric meaning for this. Imagine a rectangle with dimensions 434 and 560, and you are looking for a square grid into which the rectangle fits, that is, all sides lie on the grid lines. We find this grid by fitting a square into the rectangle. Then smaller squares of size 126 into the leftover, then squares of size 56 into the rest of that, and finally the leftover is filled out completely by four squares of size 14. The coarsest grid that fits the rectangle has therefore grid length 14. There is yet another aspect of Euclid's algorithm, and this will be a core idea for our proof. Fitting 434 once into 560, with 126 left over, amounts to splitting off the integer part 1 from the fraction 560 over 434 plus a rest of 126 over 434. We can't fit 434 into 126 anymore but we can find the integer part of its inverse, 434 over 126. It is 3, with 56 over 126 left over. Take the inverse of that, its integer part is 2, and the leftover is the fraction 14 over 56, whose inverse is 4, with nothing left over. In this way, the original fraction can be written as a fraction whose denominators nest into each other. This is called a continued fraction. Any rational number can be put into this form. Depending on the starting ratio, the number of levels will vary, but it will eventually stop, at the latest, at the common divisor 1. So, any rational number can be put under this form. But what about a rectangle with an irrational ratio, for example a size A4 paper? Its lengths are in a ratio of square root of 2 to 1. We can play the same game. Fit 1 into square root of 2, then fit smaller squares into the leftover. But look, after fitting one smaller square, the remaining rectangle is in the same ratio as the original. There is a cycle going on here. After fitting a second square, that is splitting of an integer part of 2, the leftover can also fit two squares and the leftover of that also, and so on. Therefore, the continued fraction nests infinitely deep, because Euclid's algorithm never stops. Well, that this makes sense. After all, there is no common divisor of square root of 2 and 1, otherwise square root of 2 would be rational. In this example, you already see what irrational numbers can look like. An infinite continued fraction is necessarily irrational, 
meaning that the, that the sequence of cutoff values a0, a0 plus 1 over a1, a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2, and so on, has an irrational limit. Here the numbers a0, a1, a2, etc. are positive integers and the numerators are always equal to 1. When we later divide the sine by the cosine, the resulting continued fraction will not be exactly of this form. Therefore, we now extend this condition of irrationality to continued fractions that contain subtractions and whose numerators may be some other common integer number b. Under what circumstances is such a continued fraction irrational? To make things more concrete, let's choose b equals 2 and repeat the process of fitting squares for the fraction 560 over 434 again. First, we fit one square, but then also another, because the leftovers are supposed to be negative. So the next largest integer is 2, from which 308 over 434 has to be subtracted. The leftover will now be written into the form 2 over something, and that something is then 434 over 154. Geometrically, that would amount to halving the leftover rectangle along its width 308. But that might also reduce the grid length we are chasing, and therefore we have no guarantee that the process will ever stop, because the target length might scale down to the infinitely small. Instead, let's double the length. This way, the common grid length can at most have increased, so we are sure to hit it eventually. Also, we are still working with a rectangle out for the correct ratio. Now we can fit squares and see that the third square spills over, with a leftover of 28 over 154 to subtract. Double that rectangle, and it is filled out completely by 11 squares of side length 56. Again, the doubling might have doubled the target length as well. And it turns out that the common length is indeed 56 divided by 4, which equals 14. This geometric process shows us that the rules for Euclid's algorithm can be loosened and it is still sure to end for rational numbers. We can split off more than the integer part, and we can divide the leftover by any other common integer b. We just need to make sure that the leftover rectangles will always become smaller and smaller, which is assured if each leftover fraction, the ratio width over length, is always between 0 and 1, or this is at least eventually the case. But this means in reverse that any infinite continued fraction of that form cannot stem from a rational number. We have thus found the criterion for irrationality that will fit our needs. Any infinite continued fraction of this form, where the ai are positive integers and eventually greater than or equal to the common integer b, must be irrational. Next time, we extend Euclid's algorithm even further to deal not only with numbers, but also with algebraic expressions, in particular power series, such as we found for the sine and cosine. See you then!